Welcome into this week's Degrees of Science. You know, one thing that may be on someone's bucket list is to see the northern lights, so the aurora borealis. Well, today we're going to talk about some of the science behind how these auroras occur. And today we're talking with Sean Dahl. He's from NOAA's Space Weather Prediction Center. So, Sean, I guess right off the bat, what, what exactly causes auroras to form? Hi, Brady. Thanks for asking us about that. Thanks for coming out to us. It's, it's always great when the press and the media and the broadcast meteorologists do stories about space weather because it's such a big topic now and it's so important and vastly uh, significant in today's world. And I think in one of your broadcasts, we'll talk a lot more about those types of impacts. But as you mentioned, what people really want to see that's on that bucket list is the Northern Lights, the Aurora Borealis. And that is something that's a great manifestation of energy that originated from the sun, that have traveled 93 million miles to earth and are now swarming around our outer atmosphere getting into that level and the interactions that happen between these particles coming from the sun, these energized particles, mainly in the form of electrons, and what happens with our outermost molecules in the atmosphere, eventually as those collisions settle down, light's emitted. And that's what we see as the aurora. So are auroras something that are happening all the time or do they only occur when, say, solar flares and stuff like that are going on? Yeah, they happen almost all the time, just at very, very low levels. You really have to get down to the most quiet of conditions, probably even those up near the polar regions not to see the aurora. But it doesn't take much. You get into what we call unsettled conditions, which is a KP of three. That's not even NOAA's space weather scale, and already the aurora can be visible in places like Alaska or Iceland. Maybe not in such a glorious manifestation, but maybe that green curtain, for instance, not all the colors. You get to KP of four, still below NOAA space weather scale levels. Now the aurora can be seen in, in areas of Canada and Iceland quite clearly, and maybe you will start to see some of these additional colors in those areas. You get the KP of five, now you've reached NOAA space weather scale levels, and that's when the aurora can begin to creep into the most northern tier of the mainland of the United States. So is there a reason why we see them more up at the poles? Yeah, because that's where most of the interactions are happening. So. When you have energy coming from the sun, all these energized particles, increases in the natural solar wind speed, strong magnetic fields coming from the sun, when they reach Earth, they all kind of interact. And they either connect favorably or unfavorably. And what happens is you get a lot of that energy in the very front of Earth's shield, that protective magnetopause, as we call it. But most of those interactions are actually happening behind the Earth in the magnetotail, that comet stretched portion of our magnetic barrier because of the solar wind stretches it and thins it out. It's back there where it thins out enough that connections can happen and drive that energy and bring those electrons and energized particles swarming into the dark side of Earth up into the polar regions where the, where the polar um, magne magnetic fields come in and out of our planet and they get into there and that's where they really drive into the outer atmosphere, that ionosphere. And the stronger that activity, the further equator word that aurora oval can grow and then boom you might have one of these very rare events like we had in, in may of last year where much of the globe got to see the aurora so what, what causes the different colors that we see in it it's really dependent upon the energized particles coming from the sun how many how strong the activity is but what kind of molecules they're hitting and interacting with in our outer atmosphere whether it's what kind of state of oxygen is it? What kind of state of nitrogen is it? What is it interacting with? So normally the aurora is this kind of green shimmering curtain of light. I saw it as I grew up in my childhood in North Dakota. I'd see this green curtain kind of moving slowly around, these rays of light extending up, but I never saw the great colors. The more recent activity we've had this solar cycle, I've seen those reds and pinks, and those are interactions that are happening much higher up in the atmosphere with different states of these molecules we talked about. And that's why that's how much of the world saw the aurora was a pink reddish color. And again in October and even again on December 31st and uh, New Year's Day evening there, because our eyes don't normally see that color very well because it's very dim and it's very high up in the atmosphere when we get to those kind of greenish, I'm sorry, those red pink colors. But people are capturing that with their digital technology. So where we normally think people might not see the aurora, say down in Florida, down in Texas, some of them saw it that far south, but they were capturing it on their digital technologies, a lot of them, and they were picking up that vivid red pink color, which is really quite pretty and beautiful. And so many people got the opportunity to capture it and or see it with their own naked eye. 
Yeah, one of those events I was at work and I went outside and I had my phone, but I, I wasn't sure if it was the city lights causing the color in my phone or the Aurora. Uh, so you work at the Space Weather Prediction Center. What goes in in your office into trying to forecast these auroras? We're really focused on the impact from space weather, from these storms that happen on the sun and what they might mean for our technology in today's world, satellites, power grid, aviation industry, and more. We don't really do Aurora forecasting here. We leave that to the private enterprises, but we do have products out there such as our Aurora Elevation model, which do try to predict the Aurora. And there's a reason for that, because it also affects some of our technology, just, just the Aurora itself, because it's this band of ionization energy going on in the outer atmosphere, and it can cause certain types of radio communication to become problematic. It can delay signals in GPS signals. It can cause position errors because of that. It can cause some scintillation, as we call it. So there's little disturbances that make direct communication with a satellite a little bit more difficult. And high frequency communication that the airlines rely upon flying across the oceans. They will divert their flights much further equatorward to avoid being under that auroral oval because it affects their ability to communicate in HF frequency. They just can't do it. So that's what we're focused on when it comes to the aurora. But by all means, people can see that they use that. That's one of our most commonly used products by the general public is that Aurora Ovation model. It's kind of a 30 minute Aurora forecast. But for true Aurora forecasting support, there's some private enterprises out there that like to do that for a pay by subscription service. So the, the sun goes through cycles and we're heading into kind of solar maximum. What kind of impact would that does that have on the amount of Aurora's and how far south they can end up coming down? Yeah, great pump ready. We are in solar cycle 25. We are in the maximum of solar cycle 25. We don't know that we've reached the peak yet. For those of you that don't know out there listening in, uh, the sun operates on a cycle, roughly an 11 year cycle, where we go from a minimum of activity to a peak of activity back down to a minimum. So we are in solar maximum, and that means there's been a lot of activity. This cycle was much more active than anticipated by the experts trying to forecast what a solar cycle might look like. And by the way, that's important for people trying to project where to put their satellites in orbit, when to launch them, how much fuel to put on them. They need to know this stuff years in advance. Now, the funny thing about a solar cycle and its maximum doesn't mean that you're just having activity day after day after day. It's like a roller coaster up there. So you can have periods where you go for a week or longer where you're just having a lot of activity and then things really fall quiet for a while and then things re-pick back up. It's just because of the dynamics of the sun. So I guess my point is, We've got all of 2025 yet in store for more chances of, you know, G3 or higher levels of activity, meaning people are going to get the chance to see the Aurora and even into 2026.